Tampa Bay Buccaneers versus the Chicago Bears. Brady, one more shot, fourth down, pass up the field. It is incomplete. And Tom Brady thinking he has one more down, but this game is over. The Bears will upset the Bucs 20 to 19 on a Thursday night in Chicago. Did you see all those tweets on that little screen there? Yeah, that's from our guys, Ryan Clark and Marcus Spears, as well as Mina Kimes. Everybody talking about last night. What a start to week five it was as we welcome you to NFL Live. We'll tell you why the Bears might be for real a little later on. Marcus Spears, of course, is here. Mina Kimes and Ryan Clark. We're going to get to them, but Field Yates is where we begin today. The latest news in the NFL and Field. It's been a tough week on the COVID front for the NFL. The Jets now dealing with a presumptive positive test. What can you tell us. Yeah, Laura, as you noted, just about 945 this morning, word broke that the Jets sent home their players and their coaches and all those inside the facility because of a presumptive positive case amongst one of the players on their roster. Now, as the NFL has within its protocols, there will be con uh, contact tracing conducted and all players will be retested as a result of that presumptive positive. And as of right now, we are expecting potential word about whether that retest was actually a second positive or potentially a false negative, in which case Sunday's game against the Cardinals would seemingly be very much on track. But even if a player does test positive, it is still possible this game against the Cardinals, which is scheduled for 1 p.m. on Sunday, could be conducted as scheduled. The Arizona Cardinals, within the last hour or so, have made it clear they are continuing to prepare for their flight, which will be later on today with a long cross-country trip to New Jersey to play the Jets on Sunday. But as is the case around the NFL, not just specific to week five, but really for the rest of the season. Everything is an hour-by-hour -hour arrangement. But for right now, the Jets and Cardinals still making plans to play on Sunday despite the possibility of a possible positive within the Jets facility this morning. Yeah, Field, you could even argue it's like minute by minute at this point. You will be keeping us up to date on all of this <laughs> by the minute. You're with us all show long as well, coming back with some injury updates momentarily. In the effort of good news, both the Patriots and Titans had no new positive tests today. The Titans have not been in their facility since September 29th with 23 positives, and the Patriots have been away from there since Stephon Gilmore tested positive on Wednesday. So here's the resulting schedule changes that have come down this week due to the positive coronavirus test. The Broncos and Patriots now playing on Monday on ESPN, so two Monday night football games on ESPN. The Bills and Titans currently slated to play on Tuesday at 7 Eastern. And as long as Tennessee receives no more positive tests, the Chiefs and Bills games will be played on Sunday, October 18th. This according to our own Adam Schefter. Let's get back to Thursday night. The Bears improved to 4-1 and one last night, got much of their offense in the final two minutes of the halves. Nick Foles went 7-11 for 11 with 57 pass yards through his only touchdown during those four minutes, which led to the Bears scoring 17 of their 20 points after the two-minute warnings. On the other side, Tampa Bay's offensive line struggled, allowing 10 pressures and three sacks. They committed seven penalties, including four holding calls. That's tied for the most by any team in the game this season. This led to a night to forget for Tom Brady, who was off target in a season-high 24% of his passes, was left looking confused following the final play of the game, leaving many to wonder if he forgot what down it was. You see him holding up his fingers with the four there. Here's more from Brady and Bruce Arians on that play. Did he not know it was fourth down? Yeah, he knew. He knew. Yeah, I knew we needed a chunk, and I was thinking about more yardage, and then, uh, you know, it was just it was bad execution. And we had a great opportunity there, so just didn't, uh, didn't execute when we needed to. We all have to do a better job. This isn't any one position. This isn't any one player. This is a Team wide thing. You're not going to beat anybody with 12 penalties or however many we had. And uh, especially when we were down there once and had to punting uh, because of about six or seven penalties on one drive. So uh, I didn't have our team ready to play. This was one game that um, I felt like we got out coached and um, got out played. All right, here's everybody. Hi, guys. Uh, Ryan Clark, are you buying that Brady knew it was fourth down on that final play? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm not buying this like I haven't been out buying stock during COVID. This ain't the time. 
And this ain't the time for me to believe that Tom Brady knew that it was fourth down. Listen, after that play, when you hold up your four fingers and you have the look on your face, that's four fingers and a question mark, not four fingers because I know it's supposed to be fourth down on the next play. And this is okay. This isn't an indictment on Tom Brady's entire career. But in this moment that he was brought over to be better than Jameis Winston, when he was brought over to control situational football moments, this is an unexcusable mishap. This is a mishap that cost the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this game and it is just one game and it is just one moment but now you put yourself squarely back in the fight for the NFC South with the New Orleans Saints and may have cost yourself playoff positioning this is a very important game this was a very unexcusable or inexcusable oversight by Tom Brady and a lack of uh, communication and an organizational failure by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, you move on from it, but Tom Brady absolutely had no idea what down it was, and that's on him. Yeah, 100%. Like, what are we talking about? There's no reason to make an excuse, talk about anything else. Bruce Arians and Tom Brady are on a different page. They don't know what what each other knew. And Tom Brady didn't know it was fourth down. Like, we don't need much but film in this world to tell us what's going on, especially when we watch an entire game transpire and Tom Brady had no idea that it was fourth down. First of all, he wouldn't have made this throw if he knew it was fourth down. This dude ain't open. Like, what are we talking about? Anyway, you think about this game in its entirety, and I really don't walk away from this game necessarily saying Tampa is in a a, a large amount of trouble. They shot themselves in the foot time and time and time again. You had pass interference penalties. You had the center for Tampa doing extra like he's been doing every game. Stop it, bro. When the whistle blow, just go back to the huddle and stop doing foolishness. You costing your team. We looked at a drive where they had six penalties four were on them like that is the story of the night miscommunication not being prepared and doing too damn much oh and by the way the monsters of the midway was on the other side Khalil Mack reminded us all of why he is that dude because he took advantage of everybody that tried to block him yeah Marcus I'm with you I'm not terribly worried about the Bucks. I mean, they're not going to have that many penalties again, hopefully. Um, some of the pass catchers are going to come back healthy. Tom Brady's not going to make that sort of mental error again. But the play of the offensive line is concerning because they've been so good this year at protecting Brady. But when they don't protect him, when he's under pressure, he's been really bad. 29th in QBR, 28th in completion percentage when pressured. And you saw that last night. I mean, Donovan Smith got handled. Poor Tristan Wirfs, he's had a great season, but Khalil Mack made him look like his little brother. If his little brother was five times his size, that was ugly. And it's so important going forward for Brady because the issue with Brady, I've been saying this over and over, it's not the arm. It's how he plays under pressure. It's the agility. It's being 43 years old and having these young men coming at you. They need to keep him clean. Otherwise, the offense is going to look like they did last night. Yeah, uh, Ryan, uh, Bears fans are out there like, why aren't you guys talking about us? We won the game. So what did we learn about the Bears? (laughs) <laughs> hey, listen, I think what we learned about the Bears is they're not necessarily actually better offensively with Nick Foles, but this defense is coming along. They didn't stop the run. Ronald Jones was still in Brady's face, rushing him up the middle, and obviously Khalil Mack on the outside, sunning anybody who was trying to block him. And this secondary is really good. Kyle Fuller is a pro bowler. Eddie Jackson, one of the highest paid players at his position. And on the other side, Jalen Johnson has been balling. And so if this team can keep some of these things up what you hope is is what you saw last night if you're the Chicago Bears right you hope that the games are close and in situational football moments Nick Foles can make plays and that's what we saw last night he wasn't necessarily great all game he was absolutely horrible in the beginning but he never gets shaken he never gets to a point to where he can't make plays when he has to they had a great a great scheme and strategy understanding the backs out of the backfield will be open and he hit them Chicago Bears aren't world beaters but I believe they can win enough games to put themselves in the playoffs and then you hope you can go on the magical corporate ride that is St. Nick Foles in the playoffs <laughs> and get yourself a Super Bowl. Yeah, Marcus, I mean, it, it sounds good, right, to talk about that magical carpet ride and, and here's the thing, what Foles did yesterday against a really talented Tampa Bay defense probably has to be a good confidence builder for him. 
Oh, no doubt, Lord. It, it actually solidified Matt Nagy going to Nick Foles. This game did, I think, more so than the comeback against the Falcons. Everybody comes back against the Falcons. Listen, what Nick Foles is doing for the Chicago Bears the Falcons is don't exactly deserve what that. they need. And, <laughs> and in this regard, I have to disagree with my brother and say, look, this is they they may not put up the same gaudy numbers. They they won't have a prolific offense, maybe once every blue moon. But what Nick Foles will do is probably take care of the football and leave it in the hands of making those plays, being good and situational, like Ryan said, and deferring to their defense to make the big plays in a game. Listen, this is this is similar to when when Rex Grossman was the quarterback for Chicago, for the Bears. Mm. And we talked about how good that defense was and the offense was kind of just doing what they needed to do to keep things from going haywire. Nagy talked about being Rex. zen on the sideline. <laughs> what are y'all talking? What are y'all doing? What well, are Nina, go. go. Poor We're Bears listening. fans, you're like, oh, the golden age. Rick, Rex Grossman, <laughs> back when things were better. I think um, went to the Super Bowl. I mean, yeah, hey, but Marcus, you're, you're right. Him, Nick Foles, he makes some plays <laughs> that Mitch Trubisky does not play. I mean, that uh, wheel route, I think it was to Montgomery uh, when he was under pressure. Yep. Yeah, we can show that. That was uh, yes. Mitch Trubisky doesn't necessarily make that throw. Look at this. But then, I mean, did you see this uh, deep? I don't even want to call it a deep ball to uh, poor Mooney. Pull that one up. I mean, this looks like, do you remember when 50 Cent threw that first pitch? <laughs> That's what no, it's like. not that bad. I don't even not know where he's trying nope. to go with that. Like, nope. Me neither. Was, was, it, a, was it a miscommunication? Like, I tried game CD. to game or week to week is like trying to predict the weather. Unless you live in Los Angeles where it's perfect every day. You don't know what you're going to get. There's some upside there, but you just better pray this defense continues to play at an elite level because he is not consistent. Yeah, Nick Foles, Nick Foles, I apologize. I tried, bro. But Mina Kimes and Ryan Clark ain't hearing it. I yeah. tried, bro. The 50, cent, the 50 cent first pitch might be the worst insult we've had on this show the entire time that we've been on this show. <laughs> One thing that 100%. really is important, guys, 100%. here is the injury to Vita Vea uh, for the Bucks. That's big with yeah. the ankle, the broken ankle. They don't know exactly how long it'll be up, but it'll certainly be a while. Let's get going here because we are just getting started on NFL Live. we got so much more coming your way today and after a one and three start all the chatter coming out of Dallas this week it's obviously they need a win real bad is it too early to declare yeah Laura some good news here is the Patriots are now expecting to return to their facility tomorrow after three straight days of working remotely and the team anticipates having a practice at 10 30 a.m eastern time of course this is contingent upon no new positive tests tomorrow morning, but there have been multiple consecutive days without any new positive tests for the team. So things are trending up and moving forward towards the game, which will now be played at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Monday and, of course, right on ESPN. Yeah, exactly. we got a Monday Night Football doubleheader this week. Let's get to some of the biggest injuries this week as well, Field. We start with Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson. Yeah, let's start there because it is probably the biggest name is dealing with a new injury this week, although it may not be much cause for concern. Lamar has been questionable. Uh, he is listed as questionable, I should say, after missing both Wednesday and Thursday's practice with the knee injury. Also battling a bit of an illness, of course, non-COVID related. He is expected to go. He's one of 12 Ravens listed as questionable. All should play on Sunday. They look to improve to four and one. Now, more quarterback news is Jimmy Garoppolo, who has missed multiple games now for the 49ers, actually moving forward and progressing towards playing on Sunday against the Miami Dolphins. And he had that high ankle sprain, but pot finally some good news for the 49ers, but it's not all necessarily great news as Raheem Mostert, his teammate, uh, may not play. We'll see. Sort of still an iffy one here. He has practiced a little bit this week with that knee injury, but the 49ers have depth in the backfield. They've been conservative with their medical approach all season. Remember, this is a team that has not just this week, but also the rest of the season in mind. So we'll see whether or not we see Raheem Mostert on Sunday. And then finally, Julio Jones for the Atlanta Falcons. Did not practice all week. He's listed as questionable, Laura. And although he has in the past played on Sundays after not practicing at all during the week, 
I'm a little skeptical here, and it may be that he is active, but is only used just in case or has a limited role. But right now, not looking like a layup that Julio Jones plays on Sunday for the desperate 0-4 Falcons. Oh, yeah, they're taking on the Panthers, and they need a win in a big way. You see this, this tweet here from Adam Schefter, the Chargers, placing Austin Eckler on injured reserve, promoting Tyron Johnson to their active roster, signing former Dolphins and Jets running back Kalen Balazs to their practice squad. So an update there for that. Go ahead, Field, if you had something to add to that. I'm not sure if you did, but that tweet popped up and I wasn't expecting it. So go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Laura, just as a – yeah, I think this was expected from the Chargers, obviously, with that hamstring injury that Austin Eckler suffered last week. And uh, as Adam noted, they have now added Kalen Blage. We will not see Austin Eckler until at least week eight. But in the meantime, you can expect a bunch of Joshua Kelly, their fourth-round pick out of UCLA, and also Justin Jackson, a seventh-round pick out of Northwestern a couple of years ago. So the Chargers, who are now fully in on Justin Herbert, will not have – arguably their second-best offensive player behind Keenan Allen on the field for at least the next three games. Yeah, that's important with Herbert probably needing all the confidence he can get around him, even though he's performed quite well so far. Thanks so much, Field Yates, for all of that information. And let's get to another big one this weekend. The Chiefs are 4-0 for the fourth consecutive year, and thanks largely to that suddenly dominant defense, they have a chance to get a stranglehold of the AFC West five games into the season when they host the Las Vegas Raiders on Sunday. And look, all the talk about the Chiefs is always about Patrick Mahomes and this dominant offense, but Marcus, the defense really has been quite good, and we really saw that last week. What do you want to see out of the Chiefs against the Raiders? Just continue where their path on defense. Listen, this is the part of the team that had me a little bit apprehensive about them going undefeated. But we see that the, the re return of Thornhill and Tyron Matthew, obviously, they played against the New England Patriots without Chris Jones, their best defensive lineman. But Frank Clark stepped up. This unit is starting to come together. They're starting to play at a very, very high level. And I think they're uh, about to reach the point where we have to start talking about them with the rest of the top tier type defense. Defenses, they continue to perform performance together. And I know what people are going to say. Hey, man, it was Brian Hoyer against the New England Patriots, and I get it. I 100% agree. But when you look at what they were able to do against the Ravens, you look at what they were able to do yes. last week, they're starting to string these type of games together. And if that unit becomes top five, top ten, then we will be talking about an undefeated season. Mm. Uh, I think they're already top five. Uh, statistically, that's backed up, by the way. Football Outsiders DVOA metrics, my favorite way to look at efficiency, uh, it considers down and distance. Chiefs passing attack, unsurprisingly, number one. Chiefs passing defense, also number one. Despite the fact that they've had no Bashad Breeland, despite the fact that Legereus Steed was injured, uh, despite who played well early on. Rashad Fenton has emerged, Juan Thornhill has emerged, we know about the Honey Badger. This is a well-coached unit under Steve Spagnuolo, and if they continue to play at this level, I don't know what you do against this team. Yeah, you know, what's, you know what's crazy about this defense is you watch them and they're never dominant, right? We're used to seeing these great defenses that at times you can turn on the film and they dominate. They dominate physically. There are times that teams can't move the ball at all. They aren't really like that. You know, they bend a little. They give a little, but then they make plays. They've been rotating outside at the cornerback position due to injury, and people have held up out there. Obviously, Tyron Matthew is the main playmaker. We see him make that play late, on, late in the game with June. Julian Edelman drops the ball. No Chris Jones last week, but they're still able to get pressure. But really look at this season and think about this Kansas City Chiefs offense. They haven't been the offense that we're used to. You go back to the Los Angeles Charger game where Patrick Mahomes struggled for three quarters and Justin Herbert actually played well. This defense kept them in the game. Ladarius Sneed, Ladarius Sneed with a late interception. And also Baltimore Ravens, they dominated Lamar Jackson and that offense kept them out of the end zone, were able to create pressure and play great in the past and so for me this is a huge reason one why they won the Super Bowl last year and we don't really talk about it and even this year this start is largely due to the efficiency of the Kansas City Chiefs defense Steve Spagnola is doing a great job with his coordinating coordination of the skill and the scheme of this team
You know what's crazy, guys? The Chiefs actually have a 4.7 chance to win out their schedule because that basically never happens. But that's more than double the next closest team, which happens to be the Ravens. But they have a 1.9% chance to win out. Of course, they've already lost to the Chiefs. All right, we got more coming your way on NFL Live. And keep it locked right here. The Colts and Browns game picks are next. Will a win over the league's top defense be enough for Marcus to join the Browns bandwagon? Only real team they played, they lost 38-6. Let's give it a break. Okay. They play the Colts and the Steelers, and then I'll let y'all know how I feel about the Browns. Your fantasy roster. Don't worry. You can deal with it by trading with another fantasy manager who's got what you need. Trade Assistant with IBM Watson analyzes player stats, expert opinion, and all the rosters in your league, serving up potential trades that benefit both sides of the deal. Trade confidently with AI from IBM. That's a win-win. Trade Assistant with IBM Watson, official sponsors of the win-win. These are the moments that we work for right here. This game is about passion. We said it fast and furious. I put my heart and my soul into this game. This game, folks, is about who wants it the most. Lamar Jackson, touchdown. Wants it all, has a man open. What a throw by Justin Herbert. Just to get the taste of winning, this is big. Touchdown! Seahawks! This Saints offense is making it look easy. A beauty by Roethlisberger. I get choked up about it because it means that much to me. OBJ! He's got a hat trick! That's why you see the emotions on my sleeve. It's because I care that much. The Colts and Browns are both off to three and one starts and meet in week five. Indianapolis brings the NFL's top defense in efficiency points, yards, and third down conversion percentage to Cleveland, but will be without star linebacker Darius Leonard. The Colts will look to slow down the Browns' league-leading rushing attack and Kareem Hunt, who takes over as a lead back for an injured Nick Chubb. And expect it to be a close one in this game. ESPN's Football Power Index gives the Browns a 50.3% chance to win this one, the closest of any game week five you can see our picks there mina on the browns marcus and ryan both picking the colts but everyone agrees that it will be close as you can see by the scores there let's dig into this one with smart lineup decisions informed by ibm watson mina you pick the browns how do you see this colts defense versus the browns offense matchup playing out well, this Colts defense is legit. I want to say that first. Yes, they've played easy competition, but when you watch them, um, this unit coached by Matt Eberfluss, defensive coordinator, they have a very clear philosophy. They don't blitz, they play a ton of zone, and they limit explosive plays. They keep everything in front of them. That's why on third down, opposing quarterbacks have a passer rating of 14 against them. Uh, this approach has apparently resuscitated Xavier Rhodes' career. The rookie, Justin Blackman, uh, Julian Blackman, pardon me, the safety has been phenomenal. But I do think the Browns can have success against them, especially with Darius Leonard out. Do what you've been doing the last few weeks. Run the football. Take what they give you underneath. String together some slow, methodical drives. And I think if they take that approach, they can conquer this formidable defense. Yeah, when you look at, at this defense and the way that they've been playing, though, they're making sure that they give their offense an opportunity to not have to come back, to not have to chase teams. And it's allowing Phillip Rivers to play within himself. You go back to the first week of the season, and it was Phillip Rivers throw it all around. They lost to the Jacksonville Jaguars before, because of turnovers. Now they've changed that. They play this defense that, that sits back, runs sideline to sideline with Darius Leonard, who will be out, and then they run the football offensively. The Cleveland Browns, they want to play this type of game. They want to play this type of ball. Will they be able to create an offensive, explosive play against the Indianapolis Colts that allows them to win this game? I don't think they will. I believe this is a close game. I believe it comes down to the wire. But the Indianapolis Colts will just edge out the Cleveland Browns. The only thing that scares me is with Anthony Costanzo out, this rush of the Cleveland Browns. Can Miles Garrett get to Phillip Rivers and make it uncomfortable and create some turnovers? Because if he does that, then that's what allows the Cleveland Browns to stay in this game and maybe win it. All right, Marcus, so Ryan doesn't think explosive plays will happen for Baker Mayfield in this Cleveland Browns offense. What do you think about Baker? If he's put in a position after playing much better in the recent weeks to make a big play and win this game, can he do it? 
I think he can, Laura, but he has been playing probably as comfortable as any quarterback in the NFL the last few weeks. And, and that's, not, no, that's not a slight. That's really about how well this offensive line and this run game has been. And they've mm -hmm. gotten going on some terrible defenses. What I want to see, and I think Mina makes a great point, I want to see if Matt, uh, Matt Eberflus is playing is to take the ball off the ground and force Baker Mayfield to beat the Indianapolis Colts. If he can do that, you'll hear me, you'll hear me change my tune because in order for this team to be a championship level team, in order for this team to go win their division and make a deep playoff run, we all know at some point your quarterback, the onus will be on your quarterback. Kevin Stefanski has been doing a tremendous job putting Baker Mayfield in very comfortable positions, and he, he's turned into a game manager as opposed to having to go win the game. And there's nothing wrong with that because people will take that the wrong way. But there will be times this season – particularly when they play the Indianapolis Colts, possibly, he'll have to win the football game, and I want to see if he can do it. Yeah, if you're worried about Kareem Hunt taking over for Nick Chubb there in Cleveland, you shouldn't be worried about it because this season, Kareem Hunt averaging an NFL high 3.1 yards per carry after contact. No other player is averaging more than 2.9. We got some news here on NFL Live right now coming from Adam Schefter. He's saying that the Browns will also have tight end David Njoku. He'll make it through. Uh, he made it through this week of practice healthy. He's expected to be activated, so another weapon for Baker Mayfield there. And then some more news recently tweeted by Schefter saying that Jimmy G is back. The 49ers quarterback will start Sunday against the Dolphins after missing the last two weeks. So we'll see if that's a shot in the arm for the 49ers as they continue to deal with so many injuries. Maybe they can get healthy and salvage their season in a very tough division. We got more coming your way on NFL Live with the Dallas early struggles this season. Find out what warm former Cowboys Hall of Famer thinks of the team. Good. Players just simply didn't execute, but yeah, that was uh, that was pretty ugly. And unless that changes, it, it doesn't really matter what you do from a scheme standpoint. Uh, you're going to have problems. Man, all right. So the Cowboys' defense is off to a historically bad start this season. They've allowed 146 points, 1,722 yards, and 101 first downs. All of those, as you might imagine, the worst that the team has ever allowed through four games in a season in franchise history. The only good thing going for the Cowboys' defense is they play the Giants this week. They're averaging a league low 11.8 points per game this season. So as our researcher Buggy said, it's like bad on bad. So that might help at least a little bit. Ryan, what do you see out of the Cowboys? What do you want to see out of them after all the criticism this week? Well, I think the, the, the one thing you see out of the Cowboys is at least six days of the week, they aren't getting ran through by another opponent. I think that's one thing because, well, they don't play on those days. <laughs> the other thing is when I watch the... When I watch the Dallas Cowboys play, I wonder what Marcus Spears is thinking. I wonder what he is feeling. Like, I feel bad for my dog. Like, I want to text him and say, hey, man, it's all right, bro. Like, how are you going to spin this? I want him to – I want to ask him, should I say anything to prop him up to make sure he's feeling good about himself while he watches this? When Xavier Woods, who I know personally, by the way, says – 70 plays, like, you can't expect NFL players to play hard for 70 plays. The hell I can't. That's why you're out there. And the reason that D linemen sub is because because they're bigger players, because they bang every play, they can't go hard for 70. So we get other people in the game for them when they're tired. So whenever you're out there, you're supposed to be all out to the ball until the whistle is blown every single time. And that's all I expect to see from the Dallas Cowboys. I don't care if they give up 100 because you used 100 a lot of times just now, Laura. And I don't even know what all that means in four weeks, but it seems like a hell of a lot. All I want to see them do is run to the ball, be physical and hit. Period. If they score, they score. This team has to send a message that, like Demarcus Lawrence said, they will not be soft. Because if they are soft, we're going to have to miss Marcus Spears for the rest of the week because my boy is going to stress out and be in the hospital. And this is not the time to send my dog to the hospital. So please, please Dallas Cowboys, be somebody totally different than you've been the first four weeks. Because what you've been, that ain't it. Sorry. I'm sorry, Marcus. I get emotional when it come to you, man. I get emotional. You okay, buddy? Marcus. Somebody come. 
You okay? Somebody come get me out of the sunken place. I'm in the sunken place. I'm in the sunken place. <laughs> get out. Every time I hear the Cowboys, I go to the sunken place. I'm falling in a black hole, and I can't. Nobody's throwing me a lifeline. Nobody's trying to save me. And I think Ryan Clark, I think, look, I don't want to be confused about what he just said, but I think he just tried to throw me a lifeline. I think my dog just said, I'm going to look out for my boy because nobody else is looking out for him. All right? And, Lord, am, you've man. known me longer than anybody, and you still ain't throwing me a damn lifeline about these cowboys. I like to watch you suffer. Every show on ESPN, I'm Ooh. getting ripped about the cowboys, and I got players talking about you don't play hard for 70 plays. Mina not even sending me the text in the group text that we have about I feel for you, bro. <laughs> I need lifelines from y'all right now. But let me get okay. to the game, okay? Ryan. Go ahead, Mina. Go ahead, Mina. No, me I, I was going to say a lifeline. Anthony Brown is coming back. Jadobia Wuzier is coming back. I don't know. I got. I mean, yeah. look, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I would pay $50 for a camera just on Marcus Spears during Cowboys games when the defense <laughs> is on the field. I think that's an amazing business opportunity. I just want to throw that out there. Well, it is. Marcus, it is. let me ask you something, though, because we were wondering about this when we didn't know for sure if Tyron Smith would be out. Now it turns out he is going to be out for the rest of the season. What does that do for the, the offense that has been quite good, has been the only thing that Dallas Cowboys fans and the team could really hang their hat on? Laura is no good. And listen, this is this is this is one of those situations now where you see the leadership of Dak Prescott, the figuring of things out between Kellen mm -hmm. Moore and Mike McCarthy when you don't have Tyron Smith. How will they do this? How will they plan formations? How will they change offense based around that? Look, this offensive line is now depleted. Zach Martin is the only one left. Looney was injured as far in, in a game and hurt himself. So even a backup, now you're on a on the next guy, the, the issue with the Cowboys is this. Defensively, they are they have a scheme problem. They have an effort problem, even though they don't say it. But that is a correlation between possibly not knowing what to do, but also being in a bad situation. And offensively, when you lose Tyron Smith, it's everybody has to step up around them. And look, for all yep. intents and purposes, minus the turnovers, this offense has been doing a tremendous – they're the only reason any hope still survives for the Dallas Cowboys. But that's a big loss for them especially Dak in his backside. All right, let me throw you your lifeline. You ready? The Cowboys have won six straight yeah. games against the Giants. Take it. That's your lifeline. I'll catch it. Yeah, there you go. I'm pulling you back in. All right. <laughs>